Cheers. Um, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, this is certainly not what normally happens when I pop into Sainsbury's for a beer. Um, yeah, so I'm James Clemens. I work at uh, Cambridge Consultants in like a, uh, a kind of researchy end of it, working on sort of machine learning, AI. Um, and we do a sort of variety of things from like designing neural nets all the way through to, well, how would you put them on servers? How would you plug this into a cloud server? How would you plug this into people's services? And also, actually, how is this going to sort of change the way we live? That's kind of where I'm interested, particularly. Um, I will just plug our website. We have a YouTube channel where we sort of dump some of our public stuff. Um, I say dump, carefully edited videos, very pretty. Um, and yeah, there's a fun brain graphics on the design as well. So you should check that out, digitalgreenhouse.ai. So yeah, this is roughly the sort of what I'm, what I'm going to go on. So a little bit on, on where I think, uh, where we sort of think AI is going um, and why that's sort of interesting to the user. Um, and what does that mean for UX? And then uh, I'm going to chat a bit about some of the things we've done and publish. So yeah, I think my first message is kind of um, AI is kind of seeping in everywhere. Like it's, um, I put a few examples up, automotive, medical, industrial robotics, entertainment, you know, deep learning has probably touched your Britney playlist on Spotify. Um, and if you think you're in an industry where actually uh, AI isn't gonna, gonna help you or, or, or sort of actually compete with you, then either you found like the last bastion where only humans can, um, can do their job and no AI can ever touch it, uh, or you're just wrong. Um, yeah. So I think as Chris kind of said earlier, there's very much two camps. There's the camp that says, uh, sort of, oh, AI is going to take over the world, and it's terrifying, and we need to legislate against it, and it's you know, really scary. And then there's also uh, the kind of people who say, it's going to save us all. It's going to solve climate change and change the way we live in a sort of really helpful way, let us all live together in a more happy, peaceful way. Um, and I'm definitely in both camps. Both are going to happen, I reckon. Um, that is my prediction. Um, now, maybe it's sort of sci-fi, but maybe you could imagine a situation where your uh, embedded health implant works out you didn't sleep too well. Um, so it knows how strong it's going to make your coffee when you go into work, which is going to be 15 minutes late because you're not going to get out of bed very easily. And it knows how likely you are to maybe want a driverless car to take you to that obscure techno night that you have an 83% chance of enjoying, according to the pleasure response it detected from your neural implant from your... Uh, from when you were played five songs on the edge of your genres that you like to listen to. You know, like, maybe this is all sci-fi, but actually a lot of the tech is getting there. A lot of people are working on this stuff. Um, those are all actual real examples of sort of things that are happening. Um, but today I think a lot of the most advanced AI is still kind of hidden. It's still in servers and backends, um, and it's sort of just gently manipulating what you do um, it's sort of gently seeping through, but it's kind of slightly hidden. And I think one of the big ways that's going to be brought out into the open is by sort of bringing it into our lives with good user experience. And I think this is where the both kind of join up. Um, so here's a pretty graphic. It took me a very long time to make in PowerPoint. Um, and um, I think this is kind of my most important thing I'm probably going to say. If there's one thing you remember, just remember this. I think. Um, this is a kind of cycle that um, whatever you want to call them, services, products, um, and a lot of experiences in the home and in the work, et cetera, are sort of going to follow. Um, because AIs need data to train. Um, and AIs kind of give you this sort of quite different approach to user experience, this sort of approach of, hmm, I'm no longer just dealing with a sort of rule-based bit of software that occasionally crashes and, and I shut down on Windows Task Manager. Actually, you're you're getting something that um, is a little bit intelligent. It's got a little bit of human inside it. Um, but that little bit of human needs to learn, like a little toddler, um, until it gets kind of better at what it's doing. And so this cycle, what I'm sort of saying here is that, yeah, initially, you've got an AI. You train it on some data. Um, and that sort of delivers an experience, um, whether good or not. Uh, it gets used. And then as it gets used, that data is collected from its use and is kind of fed back. And when it's fed back, the AI can retrain. It gets better and gets more users because its user experience, the thing that it's ultimately powering, gets better. And the circle kind of goes round. 
Um, and I think the sort of the biggest example of this um, to date is probably Alexa. Um, but yeah, this is what sort of drives, could drive a very interesting human sort of AI um, connection much closer together. But crucially, this has to be there. Um, yeah, take Alexa. This is a product that was launched a while ago, but it's, um, it halved its error rate between 2014 and 2016. It actually got twice as good. It didn't just like, get a bit worse when its batteries ran out. It actually, the thing got better. And the reason it got better was that it learned. People talked to it. It got lots of wrong answers. Uh, stuff was flagged up in offices, and they addressed it. Uh, they retrained their AI, and it got better. And then it got more users because it got better, and everyone talked about it. And this kind of, um, this kind of driving of, of, of users wanting to use the thing more because it's better led it to get better. Um, and I think that's absolutely crucial when considering how to sort of combine the two fields. And there's examples where it goes wrong. Uh, the sort of the Mercedes that looks like a fat smart car, that got um, the A class. 35% uh, of its customer complaints for a while uh, were because it had a very poor voice recognition system in it. Like it would only respond well to um, middle-aged white Germans. Uh, it would do exactly, exactly what they said it told it to do, but anyone else, no chance. Um, kind of uncomfortable truth. Um, and that was really because it missed a bit in this cycle. Like, yes, it had a sort of reasonably novel approach to doing speech, but actually it never improved. Um, and because it never improved, it never got better. It, the users it didn't grow to like it, didn't grow to sort of think, well, maybe you'll get better. It just was bad. Um, and it created quite, quite a negative image for, uh, for like the infotainment center in that car. People didn't like it. Um, so it's, it's kind of crucial to get the parts in this circle um, in there. So on to one of the things that we looked at. We wanted to play with the kind of, um, the kind of AI that um, it does sort of signal analysis, which all sounds really boring. Um, but actually, it is the sort of stuff that does audio. It is the sort of stuff that does medical sensors. You know, it's the thing that's going to notice your car is breaking down from like, the vibrations in the, in the engine and that sort of thing. Um, so a kind of a pretty interesting field of, of AI. And we thought, well, let's try and solve a really human problem, a really opinionated human problem with it. Um, that probably doesn't really need solving, but you know, research. Um, so we created this thing um, called the aficionado. And what it did was, um, or it does, is classify piano music as someone's playing it. So you have a grand piano with some microphones, and you have this big box of GPUs, and it sits, and it tells you what it thinks you're playing. Um, and it does this better than I can. I'm not a pianist, but I still can't really tell what's classical or baroque. Um, you all probably can, but I can't. And yeah, it does this. Um, it solves this sort of quite difficult human subtle problem that people might argue over, uh, which was something we wanted to prove AI could kind of do, um, because imagine the sort of things that could solve in everyday life. Um, and yeah, we then decided mm, it actually works. Um, maybe we should make this into a pretty demo. Uh, and so we wanted to sort of create a, um, a kind of way we could show people that this thing is good. It does the job. Um, and so we worked on a design for a um, quite rapidly built user interface to kind of present this entire problem. In one, in one screen, we wanted the user to be able to think, hmm, I get what it's doing. I get why it might be useful. Um, and this is what we came up with. Yeah. So it's actually, a, it's actually a big pile of web stuff. Um, and what it does is it, it kind of shows, it just presents the user everything. Everything that this system does is on that screen. You can see this um, sort of deep learning system on the top with the exact architecture we use. Even the widths of those sort of little wormy things that kind of move, that actually kind of represents how the data funneling works. That's roughly proportional the amount of data that goes through the thing, except the end, actually, uh, which is the sort of real powerful time bit of the brain. Um, but it's this sort of really classic machine learning kind of um, presentation where you have the, the stuff going in, the stuff coming out, and there's just some magic in the middle. Uh, that's kind of what it shows. But we really wanted to prove this is better than um, what you could just sit down and code, because as engineers, we think, you know, just give me some Python, NumPy, fire it up. 
probably do a bit better than your stupid thing with tons of GPUs heating the world up. Uh, and we did have a go at that, and it was a lot worse. In about the same amount of time it took to build the AI, we had a separate team running, building a kind of detector system that was like, hmm, if the, if the notes are like pressed all one after the other, it's probably Baroque, and if it's one big mess, it's probably jazz. Um, and, and that was sort of fed in and presented sort of like for like with this AI system. And hopefully, this was a way of kind of a user just thinking, hmm, maybe AI could solve my problem because this, this presents two best efforts and the AI won. Isn't that fascinating? Um, but it also kind of inspired our next bit of, of thought, which was actually the magic in the middle. That's a bit of a problem. Like the magic in the middle isn't really good enough for your driverless car or your medical robot like removing a cataract. Um, you kind of want to know what's going on a bit more. So yeah, and also or a term for this is the, um, the black box problem, the sort of the fact that AI is just this sort of big mush and you get stuff coming in and stuff coming out and it just hopefully works. Um, which is interesting because it, it also kind of highlights this fact that um, to make an AI really, really work and be really useful, users actually have to trust it. So you actually have to deliver a kind of um, a sort of an experience to users that, that actually makes them trust your system. Rather than just be kind of Ooh, scared, they actually have to think, yeah, okay, yeah, I, I understand, I, I, fair enough. Um, because these things are not rule-based. They are a little bit human in the same way that you are a bit unsure first when you meet someone and you gradually gain trust or think they're awful. Um, you have to do the same thing with an AI and you have to create experiences that allow for that to happen. And so that was sort of our next sort of experiment, which is why we took a kind of control AI, the sort of thing you might use to um, yeah, control a bit of a factory or drive your car for you or you know, not burn your toast or, or maybe like work out how to control something in the kitchen. Um, we took that kind of an AI and built um, a Pac-Man playing system. Now you may have seen a few of these on the internet, there are a few, um, but our one looks like this. So on the right we have this perfectly normal Pac-Man game, which everyone knows how to play. And on the left, we have this, um, this sort of representation of what the AI is planning, what the AI is thinking of doing next. And the whole idea of this was that we would try and create this kind of experience that just delivers trust. So you're supposed to stare at it for a while, get kind of hypnotized with all the sort of black and yellow, it's kind of crazy, um, and then think, hmm, actually, yeah, I, I see what it's thinking. You know, I, I'm actually, I can see why it might go there. Yeah, look, it's got a bit left to go. Oh, it's going to have to avoid these. Oh, be careful. And by sort of doing that, you, you, you always naturally think, yeah, OK, I'm beginning, to, I'm beginning to believe you. I'm beginning to understand what you're thinking. Um, and this like, experiment was supposed to be like a little lab that allows people to sort of increase and decrease the training to prove what it would look like if it was trained terribly. So now we've stuck it on almost no training. And look, you know, is that... Is that what you want to drive your kids to school? Is that what you want to? Uh, <laughs> is that what you want to perform open heart surgery on you? I mean, you know, it depends. Uh, depends what you what you like. But um, no, um, and that was the whole point of this. The point was to show, look, this is not reasonable, but this is reasonable, um, and that's going to be incredibly important. Yeah, they go. It learned next level up. It learned how to run away, um, but it didn't. It didn't actually learn how to eat anything. Um, which is also very curious how you weight kind of objectives in AI because you can kind of design experiences specifically by how you train them. So you could weight a, a routing AI to be good for safety or speed or fuel efficiency or something. So interesting field, but out of what I probably have time to talk about here. Um, anyway, but yes, this was our kind of most recent thing. And it is, it is just trying to allow a user to trust the AI because that is, yeah, you can also add a ton of ghosts and totally screw it up. It's quite fun. Um, because that's the aim of the game, because AI will just not work. Back to that circle. If you don't have the users happy with the kind of experiences that AI enables, they won't use it, it won't get better, it won't be any use. Um, so it's kind of crucial to gain that trust. Let's have a look. What do I have next? Yeah, we're also doing um, a little bit of research for when we're hoping people begin to trust AIs a little more to actually put things in AIs for sense. So a little bit of silicon that could sit in your toaster and notice your toast is burning, or it notices that maybe you look a bit tired and are going to forget this toaster, this toast in the toaster. I'll keep it warm for a bit. Um, maybe like a microwave that you stick your 
frozen food in and you don't need to put the time on it, it just takes care of it because it notices what food's in there. Or, you know, a, a mower that, um, that noticed you took a bit longer to walk across your grass, so actually maybe we should mow the grass now um, automatically. And I think this is kind of my fun little prediction of where I think this stuff is going. So if you look at sort of mobile phones, you, you kind of started with sort of you know, being able to text, maybe voice calls um, and picture messages. All of this stuff moving to the right is a higher human data bandwidth between the device and the human. So like the actual human data, i.e. the words, the meaning, the emotion, the data rate of that stuff, not just like data megabytes on your phone, but actually the data rate that of, of you that is going across the medium is kind of increasing. And actually, you know, a video call, where well, you get all of the meaning of the words, the face, how they're looking. You can probably detect someone's nervous without even noticing from what they say, because you can just notice the, the kind of human data bandwidth is going up and up and up. And I think that's exactly what's going to happen with AI. And I think, yeah, right now we're beginning to see sort of the start of things to come with chatbots and real-time speech like Alexa. But you know, actually, at some point, the experience of this is going to be its personality. Like beyond the kind of speech recognition, if your medical AI is a total hypochondriac, you're never going to turn it on. Um, or if your yeah, friendly chatbot turns into a Holocaust-denying, um, like, yeah, Tay.ai sort of thing, um, which curiously didn't work in the West, but they tried the exact same thing elsewhere in the world, and it worked just fine. Because our culture was, well, we got this thing, let's give it a poke, let's have some fun with it. Oh, yeah, we broke it, so was, um, But actually, that was, that was kind of our culture. We, 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 it's kind of ingrained in us that you, know, you kind of want to kick the thing a bit. But that's not true everywhere, and actually, the same thing did work elsewhere. So actually, you're also going to have to start considering culture in your chatbot personality. And actually, all the lines between things like UX and even psychology and stuff all kind of break down because you have to consider all of this stuff. Um, and for me, like, the most exciting is, is this, because there, there are just some new opportunities to create the new way that we interact with the stuff around us that I couldn't even predict. But I reckon AI will deliver, um, along with designers kind of like you. Um, so these are my, my three takeaway messages, I suppose. I think the first one's just wrong. It's kind of already here. It's, it's pretty close. Um, and it enables like a bunch of these experiences that just take care of it. You know, like actually a while ago you'd have to hire a chauffeur to like drive you around. Well, now you have Uber. Uber definitely uses machine learning inside it. Um, and you know, maybe in the past you might have a personal assistant who orders you stuff off the internet. Well, now Alexa will just kind of do it for you. And so I think there's a lot of these really interesting things where this slightly human piece of software, this AI, can just do it for you. And actually, if you're thinking, oh my god, where do I begin? with this stuff. A really nice way to think of it is, I've got this service, I've got this product, I've got this thing that exists. Um, how, how would a human do this? You know, how would a human make my toast for me? And if you kind of ask yourself that question, if you just replace the human out with the AI, you can begin to see how AI might change and improve kind of where you're looking. Um, I think that's, that's everything I have to say. So thank you very much. James, um, questions? Oh, we've got a question at the front here. Hiya, great Hi. talk. Um, I was having this uh, kind of debate this afternoon, and one of my kind of queries was the next step is probably adding an emotional design towards AI. And an emotional how, design, did you say? When I say emotional design, you know, you've got Alexa and you yep. say a command. And then if it doesn't understand you, it'll stop and say, I don't know, or you know, repeat the, the question. But say if you added uh, an emotional element, so it kind of builds up trust and, in a sense, understands what you, you're probably thinking or, or what to say next, and just carry the conversation. Do you think mm. that's an opportunity to be explored? Yeah, so I think it's absolutely spot on. I think that's, um, that stuff is coming, I think. Uh, has anyone seen the film Her? Have you seen the film Her? Yeah, so basically that. <laughs> That's my answer to that question. Well, I think, yeah, you're right. It's, um, we have sort of products that are fighting for your, your, your attention right now, like Alexa and Google Home and all these things. But actually, at some point, you're going to say, no, I like you. I've got this AI that, no, I now actually like. 
like this chatbot I like. And as a designer, working out how to, how to produce that is going to be absolutely the next steps. Yeah, I agree. It's scary because you could almost kind of replace family members. You know, I will talk to you, I will speak to my machine. Yeah, well, my family's really annoying, so I can't wait. But yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Good question. Thank you. Hi, uh, really great presentation. Um, you spoke about Alexa and uh, the fact that at the beginning, um, in 2014, it was a bit shit and then it got better. Um, yeah. If everything takes time for it to learn what the user wants, do you see that as being quite a dangerous space where users might drop off and, and acceptance levels might lower because they don't get through the training required to, yeah. for the system to learn. And do you see any sort of ways around that, any ways that we could uh, speed it up? Oh. Yeah, it's, yeah. Very, it's a very good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I sort of think um, a lot of the large companies that have like all of your Facebook chats, all of your Slack chats, all of your um, phone conversations over FaceTime, actually have these huge data sets that they can sort of quietly develop behind the scenes and just produce new magic things. But I think there's really, um, it's going to be really interesting how people who aren't those companies come in and, and add AI to their, to their offering um, without those data sets. Um, now, I don't really know how to answer that question. I think it's, it's incredibly difficult. Um, certainly one of the things we're working on is synthetic production of data. So you sort of take a data set and you work out, well, how can I expand it into something as big as some of these other people might have to try and train a, a really smart AI with not too much user data? And that's, that's a quite a hot topic at the minute. So I think that's maybe one direction people go. Um, I actually think the scariest thing for me is the point where people say, let's get rid of some of the boundaries between these AIs. Let's just use this unidentifiable information and share it between them. So actually, if, if Uber can make a deal with your power company to get your power usage stats, it can begin to predict when you might need a car. And, and that, for me, is some of the most terrifying stuff. And I think that's, that's also going to be really interesting. But it will also allow kind of, um, it will, it will allow kind of data to leak out and into your bucket, which might be really useful if you're trying to design a, uh, a system. Yeah. Right at the back there. Yeah, so I think it's a bit more of a semantics question, but I'm just trying to understand the difference between AI and machine learning. Uh, yeah, one probably just gets like more hits on Twitter than the other one. Like, I don't know. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's, um, I think machine learning is, 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 is kind of the field. People um, also talk about deep learning, and by that they generally mean um, kind of a fatter brain, so more layers of the kind of fully connected network or whatever you want to call it. Um, and the idea of um, having more layers is that thing can learn sort of more subtle things further down the line. Um, and that's often what referred to as deep learning. And then AI is almost always what people refer to as deep learning, um, I think, because the AI is this scary thing. And like actually, um, fitting a straight line isn't very scary, but deep learning actually is quite scary. So generally, yeah, very interchangeable terms, um, but AI is probably what I refer to as the fashionable form of deep learning, fashionable term for deep learning. That's probably what I'd say, yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to stop questions there. James is sticking around at the end. Um, yeah, free beers. Uh, <laughs> free beers. Thanks again for James. Thanks very much. Thank you.